Well, hello again, everyone. It's me, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we get started on today's video, as we are talking about Indian aircraft of military might, I'd love to know what your favorite aircraft is out there. Is it the beautiful jet that we're going to look at today, or is it some other variant of a fourth generation fighter? I would love to know what your favorite fighter jet is out there. Put it in the comments section. Maybe we can have a bit of a debate or conversation in there. Today, though, we are talking about the Indian Tejas. Yes, this is quite a fascinating aircraft program. It's, uh, I kind of guess, strewn in a little bit of controversy, just like any program out there. There's always going to be some tribulations or problems that came into when it first came into production or in development, and this is certainly not without that particular stigma. And unfortunately, for an aircraft of this kind, uh, it's been given a really bad rep. And I think it's time to have a little bit of a discussion about it. I've watched a number of videos on this aircraft uh, on YouTube recently, done a little bit of research, and I do find that this aircraft gets a little bit of a hard rep that it should not get. Um, I have a massive respect for the Indian Air Force and the Indian aircraft manufacturing industry in India itself for producing this aircraft. There's a number of reasons for this. First of all, anything native built or produced in the country that's hosting or procuring or using that weapon system is a big deal. You know, they're not reliant upon other nations, other systems to produce their own aircraft. And for a fourth gen fighter, for a nation to produce pretty much all of it himself, that's pretty damn cool. And it's adding to the country's industry, their financial portfolio, and of course, just the pride in being able to utilize this jet. But a lot of people speak of the Tejas as uh, a bit of an oxymoron when it comes to pride, because the program, which a lot of people believe in its infancy, should have been cancelled when they started having a number of problems with it. It started to develop through the generation of the huge gap between the Ajit in 1978 and the LCA in 2001. And since 2001, the LCA, or the Tejas, is now formed as its name, has just been strewn in a lot of problems. We're going to talk a little bit about it today, but personally, I do feel that India has done the right choice in continuing on working with this fighter jet. And a lot of people are going to hit me for that and say, well, of course, Matt, that's the easy way out is to just say, well, it's just the way it is, just roll with it and spend more money. But I do think that the capabilities that the aircraft provides is getting better. Uh, and the information that's coming out pertaining to sorties that are being operated with this jet are adding value each and every time as they upgrade and learn about the jet. But I know a lot of people out there do not like this fighter. And let's just get into the details of the aircraft and I'll let you decide what you think of it. So the Indian Tejas Light Combat Aircraft, or LCA, represents a significant milestone in India's aviation history. The journey of its development began in the early 1980s when the Indian government sought to replace the aging MiG-21 fleet. The project was entrusted to the Aeronautical Development Agency, or ADA, in collaboration with Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. The aim was to create a multi-role fighter that could be indigenously developed and produced. The design phase of the Tejas LCA was marked by numerous challenges though. The aircraft needed to incorporate advanced technologies, be lightweight and yet powerful enough to compete with other contemporary fighter jets. The team opted for a delta wing design which provides better stability and control, especially at high speeds and altitudes. This design choice allowed also for a reduced radar cross-section, enhancing the aircraft's stealth capabilities. One of the most significant breakthroughs in the Tejas project was the development of composite materials for the aircraft's structure. These materials not only reduced the weight of the aircraft, but also increased its strength and durability. Over 45% of the Tejas' airframe is made up of a composite material, making it one of the highest percentages in any combat aircraft globally. The aircraft is powered by a single engine, initially the General Electric F404 and later the more powerful F414. The integration of the engine posed several technical challenges, particularly in ensuring the compatibility with the airframe and achieving the desired performance parameters. Additionally, the avionics and flight control systems were developed indigenously, incorporating advanced features such as fly-by-wire technology. The aircraft made its maiden flight in January 2001, and since then has undergone extensive testing and modifications, and rightly so, there has been a number of issues with getting this aircraft to fly to what they wanted it to do. The development phase was very lengthy and extremely complex, involving rigorous testing to meet the Indian Air Force's stringent requirements. Despite huge delays and massive budget overruns, the induction of the Tejas into the Indian Air Force marks quite the significant achievement in India's quest for self-reliance in its own defense technology. The aircraft is designed as a modern multi-role fighter designed to meet the needs of its Air Force, and its operational history and deployment reflects India's commitment to enhancing its aerial defense capabilities with indigenous technology. 
The journey from its conceptualization to active deployment has been both rewarding and challenging. It was formally inducted in January 2015, marking a very large milestone for the overall Indian defense sector. The first squadron, known as No. 45 Squadron Flying Daggers, was based at Salur Air Force Station in Tamil Nadu. The squadron initially received the Tejas Mark I variant, which was primarily intended for evaluation and training purposes. The induction of the Tejas into operational service was a crucial step in replacing the aging MiG-21 fleet, which had been the mainstay of the IAF for decades. The aircraft has since been involved in various exercises and deployments around the world. One of the key exercises was Iron Fist in 2016, where the Tejas demonstrated its capabilities in precision strike, air combat and defensive roles. The aircraft's performance in these exercises showcased its overall reliability and versatility, earning quite a bit of praise from defense analysts and military personnel alike. However, it was not without its own flaws. Although the testing and development of the aircraft up until this point was very well, more and more issues continued to come up with this aircraft even in its modern standpoint. In addition to some of the domestic exercises, the Tejas has also participated in international air shows and exhibitions, including the Bahrain National Air Show in 2016. Now, in terms of highlighting on the global stage, the aircraft isn't really showcased, so to speak, because in an international standpoint, it's not really competing to some of the fourth generation fighters, but when it comes to showcasing it within its own region or area, which is of course in India and countries around the world, uh, it's doing pretty well for itself, particularly in places like Malaysia. Uh, a lot of interest in this aircraft and trying to get exportation to it, but a lot of people aren't quite pulling the trigger on actually buying it in the end. And why is that? Well, as I said, it has had a number of challenges most of them being technical in the way in which it relies upon its own Indian defense sector. And when you utilize something that's produced purely within one country, there's contractual issues, there's parts availability issues. It's not as simple as just, hey, we'll build everything in country, and make it easy. But that's what happens when you try and design something internally. It's, it's complex. There's a lot of, quote, moving parts, pardon the pun, to link all these different systems together. The development of the aircraft also was marred by prolonged delays in those cost overruns initiated in the 1980s. The aircraft took over three decades to reach operational status, and these delays resulted in technological obsolescence as it was actually going through its development, which increased costs and making it even more difficult to keep up with the pace of rapidly advancing global fighter jet technologies in the same branch. That beautiful General Electric engine also, which was were very reliable at the time, really didn't provide the thrust levels required for a high-performance combat aircraft, and this limited the aircraft's speed, payload, and overall performance, which therefore had them have to upgrade the engine again, which, as I had previously mentioned, as they're developing the aircraft, it's been taken so long that all these systems that link to that engine had to be upgraded again to get to the next generation of engine. And compared to other modern fourth generation fighters, the Tejas has a relatively low power payload capacity and operational range. With a maximum takeoff weight of around 13,500 kilograms and a payload capacity of 4,000 kilograms, it is outperformed by competitors such as the F-16 and the Jazz 39 Gripen, which can carry extremely large payloads over greater distances. While the aircraft does feature advanced avionics and multi-mode radar, it has often been criticized for not matching the sophistication and integration seen in other fourth generation fighters. For instance, the AESA, or Active Electronically Scanned Radar Array, is a standard in many modern fighters, and is only the beginning of a integrated system upgraded for the Tejas Mark I variant. Uh, and it's limiting the initial version's situational awareness and targeting capabilities, basically saying that the radar just isn't up to snuff. It's faced issues with some of its maintenance and readiness too. Earlier models required significant ground support and had longer turnaround times between missions, which was surprising for a single application engine aircraft uh, that was really not carrying a lot of extra payload. And this has impacted the aircraft's ability to sustain prolonged combat operations compared to its peers, which are designed for higher sortie rates and easier maintenance. It has also struggled to find international buyers, partly due to the aforementioned limitations and partly due to the intense competition established between this kind of generation, like the F-16, the Gripen, and even new entrants like the JF-17. And this has made a real difference for when it tries to get a global reach and acceptance between the defense community. Efforts to integrate indigenous systems such as the Kavari engine and various avionics have really faced technical challenges as delays though, and that's its primary focus. And while these efforts are crucial for self-reliance, They've sometimes resulted in compromises on performance and reliability compared to systems sourced from established global suppliers. 
But it's not all doom and gloom, and the hate for this aircraft I really don't think is justified. The future's prospects and upgrades for the aircraft are pivotal to its continued success and operational relevance for the Indian Air Force. It's looking to bolster their capabilities and several enhancements and variants of the aircraft are being developed to meet the evolving defence needs. One of the most significant future prospects for the Tejas is the development of the Tejas Mark I Alpha variant. This upgraded version addresses many of the shortcomings identified in the initial Mark I. This will include an actively electronic scanned radar array, which offers superior target detection and tracking capabilities compared to traditional radars. The Acer radar enhances the aircraft's ability to engage multiple targets simultaneously and operate in a more challenging electronic warfare environment. In addition to the radar upgrade, the variant will feature improved electronic warfare systems including self-protection jammers and advanced chaff and flare dispensers. These enhancements will significantly boost the survivability in hostile environments, making it more formidable adversary in modern aerial combat. The aircraft will also have an improved mid-air refueling capability extending its operational range and endurance. Another key focus is the development of the Tejas Mark II, also known as the Medium Weight Fighter or MWF. This variant aims to fill the gap between the light Tejas Mark I Alpha and the heavier fighter jets like the Sequoia Su-30 Mk-1. The Mark II will have a larger airframe, more powerful engines and increased payload capacity. It's expected to feature advanced avionics, a more comprehensive weapon suite and a greater range and endurance making it suitable for a wide range of missions, including deep penetration strikes and maritime operations. The Indian Navy is also exploring a naval variant of the Tejas designed for aircraft carrier operations which is still to this day being utilised and tested on. This variant will have reinforced landing gears, a tail hook for arresting landings, and foldable wingtips to optimise space on aircraft carriers. The successful integration of the Tejas into the Navy's fleet would enhance India's maritime defence capabilities and provide a versatile platform for both land and sea-based operations. Looking ahead, the program also envisions collaboration with international partners to enhance its capabilities further, potentially looking at it using different missile systems than the indigenous systems that they're using right now, and potential upgrades which could include some stealth features, more advanced propulsion systems, and the integration with next generation weapon sensors that are being provided from the same generation aircraft across the world. In conclusion though, the future prospects and upgrades of the Tejas LCA are promising and indicative of India's commitment to really trying to maintain a cutting edge air defence capability that they produce themselves. With continuous improvements and development of these advanced variants, the aircraft is fairly poised to remain a cornerstone of India's aerial combat fleet for many years to come, and although they have invested a lot of money into a program that has been nothing but problems since the 80s, I'm glad to see it actually coming to the forefront of their Air Force, and to me it seems like a fairly formidable aircraft to at least get some background protection for the aerial space that they're working in. For instance, the larger, heavier duty aircraft going into the front of an attack or a main assault if there was some form of Air Force engagement, and these aircraft more protecting the flanks or more critical infrastructure behind, where they're not going to be as formidable as some of the heavier I guess capability aircraft that are out there. I do think the fact that they're able to produce this internally into the country is adding to their financial commitments uh, and also just that personal pride of knowing that the aircraft can do what it needs to do and it was made by India. Does this mean that it's one of the greatest aircraft in the world? Certainly not. Does it mean that it's you know up to the same standard as other fourth generation fighters? Certainly not. And many people will say well then it defeats the purpose. Who cares about its pride? But a nation that can stand behind aircraft that they produce uh, and can be produced probably in great numbers if necessary when they actually get up to full fledgling production uh, is pretty cool and I think can add huge capability to an air force that can produce in that kind something they know that is purely theirs. And one thing you also got to consider when an aircraft is produced purely in just that country is it actually reduces the risk of the systems, avionics, weapon systems, etc. or just technology being leaked to other nations that are therefore going to be leaked to the enemy. And this is something that I think is kind of ignored, you know? Something that's built indigenously is able to protect its secrets, protect its technology, and although just a small little fourth gen fighter, um, it's really cool to know that this isn't going to really have those leaks. I know there's not a lot of high-tech capabilities inside of the aircraft, but its design and capabilities, if it was brought up to a standard that is extremely capable, won't be shared with many others because it's locked into the country, which I think is kind of cool as well. Although it's faced these challenges though, I'd love to hear your own criticisms and comparison to other aircraft. Let me know in the comment section what you think of the Tejas. I think it's um, interesting to hear other people's opinions and perspectives on these things because 
as much as the research I can do, it is purely speculative, and I'm just sort of trying to understand what the rationales behind the aircraft, and I do think they've hit the nail on the head as to what they want it to do, even though it took a very long time and a lot of money to do so, just like many programs out there today, <coughs> F-35. Um, but let me know. I'd love to hear your comments. Thanks for watching today, folks. As usual, hit that like button and subscribe. And if you want to support my channel financially, go check the links in the description box below. Have a wonderful rest of your day. All the best. Bye-bye.